Good afternoon. It's my distinct privilege to introduce our 40th commencement speaker, Mr. Robert Krolwich. Mr. Krolwich comes from a background in broadcasting and radio. Not only did he spend countless nights with a transistor radio hidden under his pillow as a kid, but he began reporting for NPR since 1976, just six years after it was created. He went on to do television for ABC's Nightline and elsewhere, and is now most known as the author for the blog Krollwitch Wonders and as the co-host of Radio Lab, a radio show that is perhaps best described by the creator of This American Life, Ira Glass. Quote, on Radio Lab, we listen in as the hosts and the other reporters discover their stories, and we hear their pleasure as they puzzle out the truth. This is part of what makes the show so incredibly listenable. Jad and Robert are on an adventure, and they're bringing us along. Mr. Krowich's approach to Radiolab is similar to COA's philosophy. The show integrates knowledge from multiple academic disciplines and then creates a space for the hosts to take the time to interact and investigate the material they've collected. They have collaborated to create a show with a new aesthetic for radio, the combination of loose explorative discussion seated on an architecture of composed music and raw sounds helps contextualize the space in place. For example, in a recent podcast focused on colors, Mr. Krowich and his co-host Jad Abumrad illustrated how much of the color spectrum a dog, a sparrow, and a human can visualize using a choir. Radio Lab won the Peabody Award in 2010, and you can tune into Radio Lab at your local NPR station or download a podcast for free on iTunes. <laughs> Please help me in warmly welcoming Mr. Robert Krowich. So uh, Alice took care of the advertising. I don't have to do any of that. Uh, <laughs> so class of 2012, President Collins, Bill, today when you come up to this place and you get your diploma and you get your hug from Darren and your flower from the classmate in this rather unusual diploma hug, flower hug combination <laughs> that you guys do, you will be finally at the door. You will be going down those stairs and you will step into what has been referred to here as the real world, which is not a house in Malibu with five camera crews. It is <laughs> the real world, the one that you're gonna have to live in for the rest of your life. And once you cross over from here to there and back to there again, things are gonna change just a little bit. Now all these people who are with you today, your moms and your dads and your siblings and your aunts and your uncles, who've been asking you so what are your plans? What's next for you? What do you want to be? You know, don't. All those questions give a little more urgency after today. Uh, though I presume by now you've got a cover line. I mean, Franklin already mentioned you'll find out as his, but uh, no, no, I'm fine. I'm going to grad school. Oh, I've got an internship. Uh, I'm thinking about teaching. Or, or maybe your family doesn't push. Maybe they just love you blindly and wish you well and you don't talk about it. But still... <laughs> It is time, it is time to address the question, who am I going to be? It's time to design a version of yourself that might work and might make you happy. Because for the next hunk of your life, certainly for the next four or five years, this is going to be your job, to become somebody defined by you. In high school and in grade school, you didn't have to design yourself. The folks in charge were supposed to do that, and they were happy to do it for you. So you were marched into a school building. You were three, you were four, you were five, depending upon your parents' choice in that matter. You're placed at a desk, you're put in a circle, you're inspected by your teachers, and after that, you do what you're told and what everybody's told to do. You show up and you learn stuff. So you have reading, check, writing, check, spelling, check, algebra, check, trig, check, history, check, Spanish, check, this, check, that, check, diploma, check, prom, and that was high school. <laughs> And then you came here to this place, and here the designers stepped back a notch and said, okay, go ahead now, just poke around a little bit, because this is an open architected kind of find your own way system here, and you choose to study various forms of human ecology, whatever that is, your parents have been saying, <laughs> and, uh, and you chose new friends, and you got to explore a little, maybe you didn't explore enough or maybe you spent too much time with your friends, or maybe not enough time, maybe somebody broke your heart, maybe you lost your way, 
Maybe you met an amazing teacher, maybe you bumbled onto a subject that now has your total attention, or just some of your attention, but by the end of college, by today, you aren't the person you were back in high school. You know a little more. You've discovered a few more things that you're good at and a few more things you're not so good at. You know the subjects you never want to hear about again, and <laughs> you're beginning to find enthusiasms and direction. And today, the day you're supposed to leave here, part of you doesn't want to leave, big part, I'm imagining. But you've packed your bags and you have to be out of your room sometime in the next few days, so it is time, and you have to be wondering, how do I do this? How do I decide who I'm going to be? Well, some of you are lucky because you already know. You think, I'm going to be a doctor and I'm in love with Ralph. I'm going to marry Ralph. My bridesmaids will be Sarah, Alice, and Nora. They are my best friends forever. <laughs> done, 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 done. Just get me to the church on time. <laughs> so I wish you luck on that. But for far more of you, the itinerary going forward is a little vague, vague in the love department, vague in the life department, and vague on your skill set. I hear approval from some dog. Is there a dog here? Oh, there. <laughs> when I graduated college, I was convinced that I wanted to be a lawyer, and a very particular kind of lawyer. I, I wanted to be the lawyer I read about in To Kill a Mockingbird, who was played in the movie by Gregory Peck. That's the lawyer. <laughs> so. I went off to law school, which I sort of enjoyed, and in the summer of my second year, surprisingly far from Gregory Peck's environs, I found myself in a skyscraper on Park Avenue in New York City in the bathroom at the urinal peeing next to Arthur Miller. <laughs> so this is Arthur Miller, the great playwright, author of Death of a Salesman, former husband of Marilyn Monroe, all-around literary genius. He was technically, if I could stretch the truth just a little bit, he was my client, or anyway, he was the guy I worked for as client. And the firm I was at, and law schools like Columbia have a habit of channeling you to corporate firms like this, I, they represented Mr. Miller and they kind of took care of him. And I had been assigned that morning to review and to pay his utility bill, which, as I recall, amounted to something like $9 and change. It was 1973, during, just before the great OPEC boycott. So prices and energy prices were really cheap, which was my point. As I stood next to Mr. Miller, I said to him across the porcelain, you know, I have just paid your utility bill, which was less than $10, and for my work, I'm going to get paid $6. You're going to be charged $12. Now, it seems silly for you to fork over 12 bucks to pay a $10 utility bill. And Mr. Miller said something like, mm hmm, and <laughs> got quiet, which I took as a sign of interest. So he, I said to him, <clears throat> What I suggest is you find somebody in Connecticut in your neighborhood, you have them come over and they pay all your bills for like $10 total. So it's going to be a win-win for you. It's cheaper for you and just as efficient. So Mr. Miller looked down at me. He was a very, very tall man. And he zipped up and he said something like, <laughs> I think he said thank you. And uh, then he left the bathroom. So I walked back to my cubby and the phone was ringing. And it was a partner, uh, a man I very much admired who worked directly with Arthur Miller. He said, Robert, could you come in here just uh, for a moment, please? So I walked in, and there was Arthur Miller sitting on the couch, and the partner says to me, so Mr. Miller informs me that he met you in the men's room where you told him our firm is overpaying you, overcharging him, and that he should seek help elsewhere. I said, no, 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 no. I don't, and that's not the intent of what I said at all. And the two of them exchanged glances. I could see they weren't going to fire me or anything, but in a gentle sort of way, the partner said to me, I didn't seem to quite understand my role here. I said, no, I was just trying to give them some practical advice. To which This is not the kind of advice a client wants to hear from a 24-year-old. And you, Robert, you know this is not the first time. He was right. I have been giving advice to other <laughs> clients. <laughs> you are 24, he said. You know nothing. And if you knew anything, you wouldn't be making everybody around you so uncomfortable. I thought, oh, this is not going well. <clears throat> and then it was suggested to me in a very gentle way that maybe, though I was clever and all, I could do the work, maybe I would be happier doing something else with the rest of my life. And I was, you know, this was pretty far along. I was already in law school and all. A little embarrassed, a little ashamed. But the worst part was that deep down, you know what, I, he was right. My heart was not really in this. So I had to reboot. So what do I do? Well, a few weeks later, I took the short line bus to a place near West Point, Harriman State Park in New York. I walked five or six miles up the Adirondack Trail up to the hills, and when I passed a ledge, I saw this prominent rock with a kind of nook to sit on, and on the edge of a cliff, there was a sweeping view of the Shawangunk Mountains, and I sat down all by myself, far away from everyone and every, everything, and I said, okay, it's time to figure this out. What am I good at? 
I mean, what do I really want to do? Do I have any idea at all? And that was a really lonely moment, me thinking, what am I going to do? And it wasn't just about jobs. I also had love issues, or maybe you call it love envy. I had a friend at the dining hall in my college whose name was Ted. And back in those days, dinner was sort of formal. So I went to a co-ed college, private college, Oberlin. And you're not going to believe this, but every night, the girls who lived upstairs would descend as a group, kind of pageant-like, to the ground floor. The guys would wait for them at the bottom of the staircase outside the dining room. A dinner bell would ring, and the older woman, who's called our house mother, would say, you may enter. And then together, we would parade in and sit. And on Sundays, we had to sit boy, girl, boy, girl, boy, girl. That was the rule. And there was a prayer before the meal on Sunday. So it was a really different age, an age which ended, by the way, this was the 60s during my time there. But the thing was, when I was a freshman, uh, we were waiting at the bottom of the staircase. I would watch this guy, Ted, who was completely, totally, madly in love with a girl. I mean, so much so that every night, like a golden retriever, he would be staring up, gazing at the staircase, landing, aching for the first tiny sliver, just the sight of his girlfriend's foot. And, and when it came, that first glimpse of shoe, he would like seize with love, you know. <laughs> and uh, I, I may be exaggerating here slightly, but honestly, it seemed to me that with every step she took down that staircase, Ted would get taller and happier and more full of wonder and joy. And I would look at this guy, at the, not at the girl, at the guy, and I would ask myself, why can't I love somebody like Ted loves that girl? I mean, his feelings seemed so true and so profound and so deep. And I'd see that glow in his face, and it scared me because I'd think, well, what's wrong with me? Why has this never happened to me? Uh, what if I've got a defect that means I'm never going to love anybody that way? I'm never going to find a job I truly love. I'm never going to find a life that makes me whole and happy. This can't happen. I have to do something to get myself on course and focus. But how? How? And so that day, sitting on my rock, I, I'll tell you this truly, I was trying to rescue myself from a future that was getting away from me. And I knew I had to fix myself, but I didn't know how. So I sat there, and if I could fly back to that rock through time and whisper to that Robert on the rock and tell him what I've learned since, here's what I'd say. And since a lot of you sitting here today are going to be sitting on your rocks in the coming year or two or three, I want to tell you too. You can't always name the thing you're going to be. I mean, for most people, it just doesn't work that way. You're going to have to back into it. Designing yourself isn't like being a conqueror. It's not like Genghis Khan going, charge, and thundering across the steps, <laughs> seizing a prize. It's not like that at all. It's more like you're nearsighted, you think you like salty snacks, <laughs> one day, fumbling along, you knock over a pretzel dish, you think, I don't know what this is, you bite it, and you think, hmm, do I like pretzels? It's more like that. Uh, Don't applaud that. Don't applaud. Accidents happen, you see. And, and the trick is to know when you've gotten lucky. To say, I do to a pretzel, this is important, you see. Yeah. This works for jobs. It works for girls. It works for most things. So when it comes to getting lucky in life, I'm going to share with you my strategy. When you leave here, you're going to be trying different things. So that's how you begin. You experiment. So for young folks who work with me at ABC and Radio Lab at NPR, they're trying out journalism. I tell them, here's what I want you to do. I'm going to expose you to a variety of tasks. And then, this is important, I just want you to notice how you feel when you do them. For example, some days, you're going to have to chase a story and get it done, get it right, get it on. And that's going to happen, boom, fast. Other days, you're going to have a whole week, maybe more, to mull, investigate things. So you're going to have slow days, you're going to have fast days. Some days you'll work alone, some days you'll work in a team. Some days you'll be the star, some days you'll be behind the scenes as a producer. As you try these different roles, I want you to notice, just try to notice, when am I happy and when am I slightly eh, you know, meh, disappointed, so to speak. Do I love the fast days or the slow days? Do I love being in a group? Do I like solo? Do I like the library? Do I like the street? Do I like thinking? Do I like doing? You may think you know ahead of time, but nobody knows. Doing it is better than imagining it. And here's what. You'll discover that the tasks you thought you'd love will sometimes disappoint you, and the task you thought you'd hate, oddly enough, you might discover you enjoy. But the important thing is this. For the next year or two, whatever you do, you should be sorting your experiences into two piles. One, for all the times you get a little bit high. I'm speaking here about emotional highs, loving what, not what you're toking. That's a whole other <laughs> thing. 
One pile for all the experiences that thrilled you a little, and the other pile for all the things that just don't quite work for you. So a year, or two, or three from now, you'll have a more and more and more defined notion of where your pleasures are and where they aren't. And those piles should keep getting more and more specific. And there's a lesson in that, because after a while, when someone invites you to a job, you'll have the tangible feeling, yeah, yeah, that's the kind of thing I like. Or, far more important, no, that's the kind of thing I don't like. And you'll know when to beg off and walk the other way. This is a do-it-yourself way to get a little luckier and to avoid making really stupid mistakes. And nobody can do this but you. Starting now, the teachers, the coaches, the uncles, the friends, they're going to start falling away, and they're going to leave you alone to figure out what makes you happy later in your life. And for some people, it's just not easy to listen to yourself, to honor your own feelings, particularly if you haven't done this a whole lot. But this is your job now, to listen not to someone else's heart, not to someone else's expectations, but to your own. Not that you won't make mistakes. You'll make really big, fat, stupid, oh my god errors all along the way. Everybody dies. Um, even the things that seem most true now, most elemental, can have a way over time of changing and morphing into mistakes. Ted, the guy at the bottom of the stairs who I told you about, he married the girl from the top of the stairs, the one he waited for every night for dinner. And I don't know why, I don't know how, but 25 years after my graduation, I was told they were no longer married. So they did not live happily ever after. Which brings me to my second thought. My first thought, in case you need to catch up, was now's the time to begin designing yourself. My second thought is, I'm sorry to tell you this, the designing never ends. The job you choose at first, the man or woman you choose at first, the friends you choose at first, they can change. The girl I chose when I came to choose is still with me. We've been married 30 years in some crazy set of circumstances. I did, backing into it really, find a true and lasting love. It surprises me every day to have been that lucky. My wife has been at the same company, I reported there for 30 years, but not me, I've gone from law to radio to magazines, TV, covering economics, covering politics, covering science, radio again, podcasting, now uh, we just heard I'm doing a blog, so I'm writing. But for me, I, I, I have to redesign myself so many times, I can't tell you how many, and all you parents here today, you know what I'm talking about. I mean, some of you have changed careers, some of you have changed mates, some of you haven't, but I know that today, and you gaze over at these folks here, at your kids on graduate, you're thinking back to your own graduation day. You want for them what your parents wanted for you on your graduation day, if you had one. May they be safe in the storm. But how do you say stay safe in a world where jobs are scarce, downsizing, outsourcing, that's how it is now, and that's how it's likely to stay for a while. It's rough. So how do you prepare for the bad weather of the real world? Well, here's my thought. Maybe you've already done it by coming here. Maybe choosing a school like this, a truly liberal arts school, taught by people who improvise, who teach across departmental lines, who believe in knowing more than one thing, and above all, who are teaching you every day by example how to learn. Maybe being here, learning this way, is going to protect you going forward. Because schools like College of the Atlantic teach you three important things. Other people, other schools teach them too, but I think they do it really well here. First, they get you comfortable with how to explore and question and learn. Second, they teach persistence. After all, you finished your senior project, barely in some cases. Some of you, you know, you are graduating, you know, so congratulations on that. So not everybody did. Some people, I think, are standing out there under a tree. <laughs> uh <-huh. clears throat> and finally, this is a place that teaches you that you aren't stuck with the world you've been handed. You can change the world. You can imagine a different world. You can dream, and I'll get back to that in just a second, but all three, the learning, the persisting, and the dreaming, that's going to protect you. Yeah, you're going to get bounced around in the real world, but these three gifts will teach you how to bounce back. I call this the Chumbawamba principle. <laughs> it was proclaimed by a small group of philosophical musicians in Britain who said, when facing misfortune, I get knocked down, but I get up again, you're never going to keep me down. <laughs> and, and that's the Chumbawamba generation over there. I don't know if you guys even know who that is. That is the gift of a school like this, because learning here is really unorthodox. I mean, we can be frank about that. It's, 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 it's getting lost in the woods and finding your way back learning, sometimes literally. And it's full of, how am I going to do this moments? And I may be romanticizing here a little bit, but hey, it's my commencement speech. Students here know that it's 
what it's like to get lost in a problem and have to learn yourself out of it. And this is a skill that will serve you all your life, not just when you're starting up, but 50 years from now, when you're winding down. My mom, for example, loved going to the movies. And as she got older, she thought it was extra important to see films so she'd have something to talk about with her grandchildren because she didn't want to be like that old lady who sits on the couch pretending to be in the conversation but not knowing what anybody's talking about. And movies give grandmas something to talk about. So she kept going to see films, even though she'd tell me, it's getting harder. It's really getting hard. I said, what do you mean it's getting, what, what's hard about going to the movies? You look up the time, you pay the money, you sit in the chair. I mean, that isn't very hard. She says, when you're 80 years old, it's not easy at all because all your life going to the movies meant going to a place with one, maybe two films listed on the marquee. You walk up to a glass booth. There's a ticket seller inside. You hand her cash money. She gives you a ticket. You take the ticket to the lobby. Another person, usually in tight pants, tears it and in half, gives you a stub. You keep walking to a popcorn stand. If you like, you buy your popcorn. You walk through a door, sit down in a velvet seat, and you watch the film. That's what it's like to go to the movies. I said, okay, so? She said, well, see, that's not what it's like to go to the movies now. Now, I have no idea what's playing because the marquee has like, not one, has like 10 films. I have to put on glasses to see if mine's in the group up there. And you have to like read as the things go round and all. And, and I can't find the ticket seller who's sometimes in the back of the lobby, sometimes in the front of the lobby. There are people walking in with computer printouts, popping plastic cards into machines. They're hitting buttons. I know nothing about computers. Meantime, I can't find my movie because it's not on the lobby level. It's apparently upstairs or downstairs. There are escalators going to different floors. And all I can think is, I can't do this. I can't learn all this. But if I don't, if I don't see the movie, I won't be part of the conversation, which makes me the silent lady on the couch nodding like she's knowing what's going on. I don't want to be that lady. So I learned about computers and debit cards and the attractiveness of vampires. 13-year-olds don't know that all this is new because everything for a 13-year-old is new. But for me, she said, I have to concentrate and keep learning. And this is the chumba wumba principle practiced by grandmas. This is my mom's way of saying, you're never going to keep me down because I'm going to keep learning. I don't dare not to. And this persistence, knowing how to learn, that you can learn, that knowledge is going to protect you all your life, this is going to keep you in the game. And before I conclude, I want to remind you one other thing. The change is not something you have to do. There are times when change is something you want to do. And there'll be moments when you see something that feels wrong to you, and you want to make it right, or at least try. Everybody has such moments. And you think, hmm, I, I, could, I could actually improve this. I could make this better. I don't know if my idea is going to work, but you go up to the boss and you say, can I try? And the boss says, I love this idea. Yes, but no. Beware that little word, but. Yes, but we don't have the time. Yes, but we don't have the money. Yes, but the audience won't like it. The voters won't like it. The client won't like it. The lawyers won't like it. Yes, but, yes, but, and the yes gets softer, the but gets louder, and this happens all the time because despite what they say, people like what they already know. The power of routine is enormous, and it can be so trivial. One time, I was about to do my very first piece on the CBS network. I was on the set, sitting on a stool. There are all these cameras gathered around me, and if any of you listen to Radiolab or, or even this speech, which I know is going on a bit, uh, things I've done, you'll know I don't talk like a broadcaster. I don't go down in the voice. I don't intone. I just sound like how I sound. And back in 1982, this was unusual. Like News reporters were supposed to speak like Walter Cronkite or Howard K. Smith from the chest, knowingly, omnisciently. So. <laughs> but I'm a little nasal. That's uh, how it goes. So. So here's what happened. The floor director is fastening a microphone onto my lapel. He's heard me talking as I'm trying to run over my script. And urgently, he leans in very close to my ear and he says, take it from your chest, not from your nose. They don't do nose here. And he, he was trying to help me. But my idea was, this is a small idea, I'm, not, I don't, I'm gonna talk like me. I mean, it's more honest, it's more natural. He was saying, yes, but don't. <laughs> you can't, you shouldn't, you mustn't, they'll fire you. And I'm thinking, come on. So the lights go up, the cameras start to roll, the director flashes, you're on, and I open my mouth, and part of me in that instant is thinking, oh my God, they're gonna hear me and say, leave. <laughs> so what did I do? I talk like I talk. The vowels cascaded down through my nose, they grew nasalier and nasalier, <laughs> out they came, and nothing happened, they didn't fire me, I survived. But I've had so many of these moments, big ones and small ones, and they're yes but people everywhere you go, yes but, 
They never got the tire that the smallest changes will be resisted, and you just have to fight back all the time. But here's the thing. The yes buts dominate most institutions most of the time, but they're also everywhere, sometimes off in the corner and sometimes not, the why nots, the give it a shots, the hey, let's just do this, people. And this school is packed with those people. Of course, you got yes buts here, but as I said, there are yes buts everywhere. But you don't go to a school with five concrete phalluses shaped like something next to a <laughs> vegetable garden, uh, unless you want to take a risk. <laughs> Many of you are here because you tried, or you wanted to try a different kind of education, a bolder kind, and you stayed. And there's a lot of you. Well, there's a clump of you, a formidable clump of you. And because you've lived with people who aren't afraid of being a little different, you know how to explore and dream these people, and you've studied them, and you've been taught by them, and they've made them, you've made them your friends, and now you know one when you see one. So you'll be sitting in a room a year or two or three from now, and you think, well, how about this idea? And across the table, you're going to catch just a glint, a little warmth coming your way, maybe just a passing smile, and it'll be so familiar. It'll remind you of the people you knew here. And you'll know, without knowing how you know, yeah, she's going to help me. She's one. And this is really important. It's critically important to notice potential allies and to recruit them and to hold them close and to keep doing that all your life. Because they've saved me so many times. My partner at Radiolab, Jada Boomerab, we met, I just knew in my bones that with him doing dangerous things would be a whole lot easier, even though... <laughs> I, just because you're a why not person doesn't mean you can't occasionally be a yes but person. So Jed butts me all the time, but that's usually to make things better, not to make me go away most of the time. So here's the point to conclude. When you're trying to create a version of yourself that will one day make you happy, and that is your job now, half the battle is to know your insides, know your pleasures. And the other half is to know your outsides, to find allies and partners and mentors. You don't become yourself all by yourself. You become you, boosted on others' shoulders, buoyed by others' smiles. You may be a singular person, but your successes will always be plural. And so, about to be graduates of the class of 2012, ladies and gentlemen, at the College of the Atlantic, it is time now to step up, get your diploma, and answer the question, who am I going to be? and how can I design myself so I have a chance at happiness. You have all the advantages of this school because you are sitting here on this campus at this time with these teachers and these friends all around you. You know now how to learn, how to persist, and how to dream. You've gotten the gifts. You're on your way. So to all of you, congratulations, and now get on with it. Boy, have commencement speakers gotten good since I graduated. <laughs> My takeaway from this is that people who are fun and lively and who can connect with people uh, can actually be distinguished. And I have a lot of formal language here about conferring vested power and, you know, privileges. Uh, but. I'll just say one or two things about uh, our honoree here, uh, which he was too modest to mention himself, or at least I didn't hear it. Um, uh, he's been called a, an act of crazy genius. <laughs> he, he, uh, his radio lab won a Peabody Award, which is really top, top of the game in uh, broadcasting. Uh, the one I really want to see is his Italian opera, Rato Interesso, uh, to explain how the Federal Reserve regulates interest rates. Being a recovering banker, uh, I didn't realize that other people knew there were so many rats 
on Wall Street. But <laughs> anyway, uh, he pioneered the use of animation in uh, Nightline. Now we're getting more formal. Anyway, more Emmy Awards, uh, cultural history of a Barbie doll, uh, computers and privacy, George Polk, Emmy Award, savings and loan bailout, serious stuff, you know, really serious stuff. But he makes it fun. And you can make your things fun too. So just take his advice and you'll go far. And so here's a degree, an honorary degree to Robert Bullwich. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs> <laughs>